All right. So for those of you who are on time, I don't want to penalize you by making you wait. So we'll jump in. Um, I actually have a little slide deck because I found so much great research in this process that I decided to compile it into a slide deck rather than just talking about it and trying to remember what I had found and memorize it all. So I will go ahead and share that. So can you guys see, um, I have the chat box open so you can use that. Can you guys see my PowerPoint deck? Okay, great. Um, so this webinar came about because um, well, first of all, I'm Adrienne Nolan Smith, as most of you know at this point. Um, I'm a board certified patient advocate, health researcher, and found the founder of Wellbe, um, which is getwellbe.com and at getwellbe on Instagram. I'm, obviously, you guys found me and found it, so you know about it. Um, but Wellbe has been, um, you know, around and sort of came from some personal and caretaking and work experiences that I had that showed me some major issues with the conventional healthcare system and really also showed me at the same time that the things that help to prevent and reverse chronic health issues naturally um, were really more of a functional or integrative approach to healthcare and then also what you do all day. So, you know, really your wellness. Um, or as I like to say, the 100 choices that you make a day, which I think are really your healthcare. So this particular topic doesn't really fit into that, but because the platform and myself are so dedicated to health empowerment, um, I found that when people I knew who I gave lots of great free resources to in the forms of guides and interviews and um, even who had gone through our online program, the Spark Health program, um, which was from January to March, if they were beating themselves up about the chain of not making the changes that they wanted to make, it was having such an impact on their ability to, not only on their mental health and emotional health, but also in their ability to actually make any of those changes and therefore also in their physical health. So I really wanted to dive into this topic because to me, it's the definition of dis health disempowerment. If you are constantly beating yourself up to the point where you can't make any positive changes as far as health, whatever that might be, you know, exercise or eating better or whatever it is. So that's how this webinar came about. And because I'm a health researcher and health research junkie, um, I really wanted to dive in and see what the research said on this topic and what was really effective to get yourself out of this negative self-talk loop and self-judgment loop into um, an empowered way of making these healthier lifestyle choices, which we know have a profound impact on whether or not you have chronic health issues now or in the future, or whether any small symptoms actually you know, can be reversed. So it's hugely important. So as I said, this is what my work is really dedicated to. Um, and I wanted to make sure that my people, you guys, were empowered in your health, not only in all the resources and programs and things that I can offer you, but also, um, and free content, obviously, but also in your own daily actions, because I can give you all the information, but if you can't get out of this head of yours, then it doesn't matter. So let's start with the problem. All right, so negative self-talk, self-judgment, criticism, bullying, shame, spiraling. I'm sure all of you have experienced this, know what I'm talking about. Um, I sure have. Um, and I should, also, I should also add that this topic came about because I was experiencing some of this myself because being in the wellness community, there's a million things I want to do every single day for my health that I've seen to be very important from the research. And when I'm not achieving all of them or doing them as much as I want to, um, or have you know just a lazy day or work too hard or whatever it might be, I, I was really beating myself up. And I thought, I know this isn't productive and I know that there's a better way and I just wanna look into what that is. So you may say things to yourself like, you're lazy, you're unmotivated, you're never gonna you know, do blank, um, why can't you do this for yourself? Your health is gonna suffer in the future and it's gonna be all your fault, um, so on and so forth. So the reason also that I wanted to do this at this time is because I think these issues and this, the, the level of this negative self-talk is louder and the whole problem is worse during the quarantine because 
we have more control over how we are spending our time. Most of us, if you have children, I realize it's not quite that way, but you know, most of us, if we were at an office or something like that, and now we're home, we have a little bit more control. And so we are putting even more pressure on ourselves to do all the things. Um, and we're meaner to ourselves when we fail to do them. So I thought this was really important to do during this time. So where does it really come from? So the issue is, Self-bullying arises from lack of compassion and kindness to yourself. Um, and where does that come from? So let's back it up even further. It comes from painful childhood experiences, as I'm sure you've heard. A lot of what happens to us in our adult years is because of things that happened to us in our childhood, which we couldn't really process because we were too young to do so. Um, and these painful childhood experiences leaves, leave us with emotional scars. And because children are more vulnerable to negativity and harsh criticism from parents and teachers and peers, that can easily shatter their confidence, making them feel insecure and or inadequate. So the desire to avoid others' criticism in the future prods us to set rules. I'm sure you have all kinds of rules for yourself, just like I do, um, or standards for ourselves, and conditions us to think that we need to follow those rules perfectly and be better than others in order to be loved and appreciated. So that's kind of like going back the route. Um, and so, but why do we have so much negative self-talk? Now we know where it comes from. Why is it so much? Apparently we have about 80,000 thoughts a day, 90% um, 90 of, 90 of which we've had before. So you probably say to yourself every, day, every single day, like, oh, I should have worked out this morning. I'm not gonna have time, like oh, whatever it is. Um, and according to Bruce Lipton, which some of you may have heard of him, he's an expert for, that was interviewed in the Heal documentary, which we interviewed the, the director and producer of, 70 to 80% of our subconscious programming is negative and disempowering. So 70% of 80,000 is a lot, as you can imagine. So why is it so negative? It's because our brains have evolved to make decisions and respond quickly to negative thoughts and feelings because they are a threat to our safety. Like, start running, there's a tiger. Um, obviously, you don't want to like finish tying your shoes, you just start running. Um, and so when we think negatively, our brains believe there's a threat. As a result, our fight or flight, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about, or it's also known as cortisol spiking, which is a stress hormone, um, it kicks in to deal with whatever threat this is. So when we think positively on the inverse, our brain assumes that everything is under control and no action is needed. So <laughs> this is, I thought, a good quote to sum it up. Neuroscientist and author Rick Hansen wrote in his book, Buddha Brain, your brain is like Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive ones. When you lose a client, when the investors don't come calling, or when you face other daily disappointments of life, you're wired to forget all the good things and instead obsess over the negative. So I thought that was a good way to explain it. Um, now, what do these thoughts do to our actions once we have them? So negative emotions program your brain to do a specific action. When the tiger crosses your path, for example, you run. When the rest of the world, so the rest of the world at that point doesn't matter, you're focused entirely on the tiger, the fear it creates, and how you can get away from it. In other words, negative emotions narrow your mind and focus your thoughts so that you can escape and survive. This is a useful instinct if you're trying to save your life, but today most of our negative thoughts aren't related to life-threatening things. They're, you know, related to, like I said, maybe you skipped your workout for that day or you ate too many cookies or whatever it might be. But still, these negative thoughts make our brains shut off the outside world and narrow the brain's scope of thinking. So a narrowed scope, what does that actually do? What does it mean? So the narrowed scope prevents your brain from seeing the other options or ways of looking at a situation or choices that surround you. When you're stressed out about everything you have to get done in a day, your brain makes it hard to actually start anything because it's focused on and paralyzed by the threat, i.e. your long ass to-do list. So it's a similar experiencing, you know, if you have negative self-talk about 
like I said, not exercising, not eating well, all your brain can do about it is, you know, all it can think about is how little willpower you have, how you're so lazy, how you don't have any motivation. It can't widen the scope to see how you can improve or how you're already doing a pretty good job because it could be that you're doing a lot for yourself, but you forgot one thing you wanted to do and then you've crashed into how you're so terrible when really most people looking at you objectively are saying, you're doing great or you're doing a lot. So again, what do these thoughts do to our actions? Some good research I found, I thought, a meta-analysis of more than 300 empirical articles showed that psychological stress is causing an overuse of this powerful safety system, which weakens our immune system, which during the global pandemic and you know COVID-19 situation, you want to do everything you can to strengthen your immune system, not weaken it, um, as well as it causes chronic disease, which is why it's my big focus. I feel like it's my job to make sure all of you, you know, avoid chronic health issues at all costs and heal them naturally and have fantastic health. Um, so it harms our mental and physical health. And I feel like, you know, that's an amazing reason to do something about it, aside from the fact that it just stinks to be in your own head feeling negative all the time. So how do these thoughts affect our goals? <laughs> um, five separate studies examined the association between self-criticism and self-oriented perfectionism with goal pursuit. So the findings demonstrated a consistent pattern of self-criticism and not making goal progress, which is really funny because a lot of us, I think, believe that the more we kind of beat ourselves up about something, the more we're going to try harder the next day and get it done. And it's actually the opposite is true. So the more you criticize yourself, the less you will actually make that, the less, you know, your chances of actually making that goal come, come to fruition. Another study in the Journal of Clinical Psychology studied the effects of worrying on performing a task. So subjects were required to sort things into two categories. People who reported that they worry 50% of the time or more showed a significant reduction or, excuse me, showed a significant disruption in their ability to sort objects. In a follow-up study, researchers were able to show that the disruption in their ability to sort objects was a result of increased levels of negative thoughts. So you can see this is being studied and this is actually pretty powerful, these negative thoughts. All right, so what can we do about it? Um, can we really change our brains? And the answer is yes. It's kind of a two-fold answer. It's very hard to change habits, which I will talk about in a second, but we can change our brains. So neuroscientist Donald Hebb, I think, said it well, neurons that fire together wire together. So the brain's habits, they're not like plaster. They're more like plastic. So they're strong enough to resist the occasional push. That's like the, you know, Monday after like a really lazy or unhealthy weekend, like I'm, I'm going to get in shape. And that's kind of the only, you know, thing you do and then it goes back to its own pattern and maybe like each monday you have another like i'm gonna do it this time um, but it is pliable enough to change in response to repeated effort so that was basically the analogy of the just on mondays you try to you know exercise if you did that every single day um you know that would be more effective in actually changing the brain so the key phrase here is repeated effort so it's about consistency it's about bringing that effort to the table to make those changes each time. Um, and now let's go back for a second to the actual negativity in our heads before we get into, you know, how we can make these habits change and, and the, you know, repeated effort type stuff. So there's a couple things, four things that I found through the research that are effective at reducing negative self-talk and self-judgment. So one, when we have negative self-talk, there's a little process where you can notice it. That's a huge piece of this. When you notice your own thoughts are negative and you can separate from them, that's you're already doing much better than most people. Um, notice it, acknowledge what's causing the negativity. So something you did or didn't do. So let's say uh, use the example, um, I keep using it, but you didn't work out today. Um, you didn't move enough. So you hear yourself like, oh, you're so lazy. You're never going to do this. 
um, acknowledge what's causing the negativity. So you didn't exercise and you feel bad about that because you wanted to. And then describe to yourself how that makes you feel. It makes you feel sad. It makes you feel uh, dis disappointment in yourself. Uh, it makes you feel, you know, scared for your future, whatever. Um, and then shift to a moment of gratitude. We'll talk about gratitude on um, the next slide. And just it can be completely unrelated, but just like have a moment of taking yourself out of that thought pattern about, you know, not exercising that day and go to, I love my husband, or I can't believe what a beautiful day this is, or um, my children are so special to me, or just, it can be anything like, you know, breakfast was delicious. Um, and just that interruption of this, you know, neuro, this neuron, um, over time, this rewires the brain. So it's pretty neat. Number two is think about your wins routinely. So ideally, every night when you're falling asleep is a great time to do it. Um, it really ends the day on a positive note. But think about the things that you did for yourself that were positive, healthful, and nourishing. And I know it sounds annoying. Like, how is that actually going to change this negative conversation that you've been having in your head for so long? But the science is there that if you can replace these thoughts, these negative thoughts with positive ones, it sends the brain on this different path. And over time, it does rewire it. So that's, you know, thinking about the things that you did for yourself that were positive, healthful, and nourishing. If you, you know, are trying to make health changes and you didn't, let's say, exercise, think about the fact that you, uh, I don't know, meditated that day or that you cooked yourself a healthy lunch or whatever it might be. Number three, convince yourself, and you must truly believe it or it won't work, um, that life is a series of opportunities rather than a relentless slog through setbacks and heartbreak. Now, everybody has different life circumstances, and some people look at that and say, yeah, but you haven't been through what I've been through. And of course, there's an element of that, but we know that it's a lot about your mindset that determines whether or not you're going to have negativity in your brain. So there are people with very, very tough circumstances that have this unbelievable appreciation for life. And there are people with, you know, seemingly a really easy life who find a way to kind of be a victim and be unhappy in a lot of different situations. So this is a huge piece, um, which I've seen from a lot of the WellBe experts we have interviewed and the research I just did for this webinar. Um, it's really important and it's very, very hard to do, I think, if you haven't been doing it. Um, so it's just, it takes a lot of like really envisioning a different, you know, way of looking at, uh, of life and all of the different opportunities before you, re rather than setbacks and heartbreak. That's similar to number two is if you have some heartbreak and setbacks at, when you're thinking about them, switch to try to have a moment of gratitude about opportunities or positive things that have happened um, to try to really rewire the brain that way. And then the last thing is practice gratitude, empathy, self-compassion, and forgiveness. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more because these are, these are big. Um, so research shows that forgiveness can be learned as demonstrated by the Stanford Forgiveness Project, which is an interesting project. The practice of forgiveness has also been linked to better immune function. Again, we come back to immune function and immune system, uh, which is so important right now, and a longer lifespan. Other studies have shown that forgiveness has more than just a metaphorical effect on your heart. It can actually lower your blood pressure and improve cardiovascular health, which I think is just so incredible. It's free. It's easy, it's fast, and being able to practice forgiveness for yourself for the things you didn't do or whatever for the things you did do, um, it's important to do for others too, but we're just focused on you right now. It's, it's incredible that that would have such profound you know, implications on emotional health, mental health, but also physical health with the blood pressure and cardiovascular impacts. It's very cool. Um, the next thing is practice self-compassion. So. You can do this by recognizing your common humanity. So seeing that, you know, I'm sure there's other people who struggle with exercise just like me when you're thinking about it or like, yeah, you know, this is not easy stuff and a lot of people have a problem with it. Um, now, that's different from rationalizing. We're going to talk about that in a second. But just having compassion for, you know, what you, that you're, that there are a lot of people going through the same stuff that you are. 
And then lastly, what sort of, this is a good question to ask yourself, what sort of empathy would you extend to a friend who was down on themselves or down about something the way that you are? So say what you would say to yourself, what you would say to that friend. You know, if, if a friend came to you and was like, I am just such a jerk, I'm useless, I didn't exercise like this whole week, I just feel like such a slob, so lazy, this and that, would you be like, yeah, you're right, you suck? No, you'd probably be, you, you'd, pra you'd be practicing self-compassion and empathy. Um, likely. And you would say, yeah, you know, it is important, but it's really hard. And um, here's a few ideas about maybe how you can try again if that didn't work. Or, um, you know, what's the thing that you feel like you struggle with the most? Or like, what would be enough so that you would feel good about it? Or, you know, maybe I can help you by, you know, getting, doing it with you or getting a coach or all of those ideas are great ideas that you can use on yourself. And also mostly because you're practicing the sort of empathy that is needed to actually let go of this negative pattern. So practicing gratitude, I am sure that you've heard something about how important this is out there. It is very important. And there's now finally a lot of research about what it does to your brain and therefore your whole physical body um, when you practice it regularly. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. Um, so just two things on this, so I, not to belabor it, but as reported by the University of Minnesota in a landmark study, people who were asked to count their blessings. So it was a group that was div divided into two parts. One was asked to count their blessings. One created lists of hassles. And the, the group that was asked to count their blessings felt happier, exercised more, had fewer physical complaints, and slept better than the, the group that created lists of hassles. So, I mean, that is just a easy, free, incredible way to, you know, improve, it looks like, your exercise habits, your happiness, uh, your physical ailments, and your sleep. Brene Brown, I'm sure you've all heard of her, has found that there's also a relationship between joy and gratitude, but with a surprising twist. It's not joy that makes us grateful, but gratitude that makes us joyful. So just the act of practicing the gratitude not only helps with reducing this negative self-talk and this self-judgment, but it also goes the other way. And actually, as this University of Minnesota study shows, you know, makes people happier. Um, and it's not just that um, you feel happiness and therefore you're grateful for it. It's the other way around, which is pretty cool. So, all right. Now I want to talk about the part of this that's, you know, creating, actually creating healthier habits. So um, habits form as shortcuts, as a way to save us time or to make us feel good. These shortcuts become hardwired because they become stronger uh, neuro, neural pathways. And it's actually not really possible to just get rid of a habit. Think about it. So you have to replace one habit with another. You can't just break not exercising as a habit. You have to replace it with exercising. Or you can't replace, or you can't just kick snoozing. It must be replaced by getting out of bed right away when your alarm goes off. So um, you have to think about it like that. So anytime you're thinking about how you wish you were doing less of something or weren't doing something at all. You know, it could be a vice like drinking too much wine. Okay, so what are you going to do instead when you're doing that? Are there things that you can do um, that become the replacement habit? So that's, that's a key. And so how do we replace bad habits? According to research done by clinical psychologist John Norcross, um, it's about environment, as I was just alluding to, not willpower. So he said, people can be so preoccupied with examining their inner thoughts and feelings that they neglect to keep their surroundings in sync with their goal. Another um, person, not a you know, clinician, but um, Arisen Martin, who's the author and founder of Success Magazine said, a strong, successful man is not the victim of his environment. He creates favorable conditions. So whatever you're trying to change, think about it. If you are trying to, let's say, quit smoking, but you only hang out with smokers, what do you think your odds of relapsing are or of actually quitting smoking? I think very low. So you have to actually design, and we're going to talk about that right now, 
design and define your environment. That's a big piece of making habit change. So we have to actively design an environment that not only sparks self-motivation, but enables us to sustain it in the long run to help us achieve our end goals. So the good news is that we don't need to constantly redesign these environments as long as we design it correctly the first time. So eventually, the current research shows it's about 66 days, but there's still some debate. You know, some people used to say it was 30 days to form a habit. Some people can say it's as little as three weeks. Um, some people say it might actually be longer than 66 days, which I think comes out to about nine weeks or so. But let's say it's 66 days. Um, once we actually form that habit, we no longer really need to actively think about it. It just becomes routine. Not to say that you'll never have, you know, a day that you don't meditate, for example, after the 66, but the idea is that it's now hardwired into your brain. So your brain will continue to kind of go to it and not resist it. So we're going to do a little exercise. If you don't have a notebook, take a second and grab one. Um, this is just like a five or 10 minute exercise, but I think it should be really helpful. Um, so if anybody needs a few seconds to grab something to write on, you can also just, you know, write on your notes app or something on your computer if you want. Um, but then we will jump in. So we're going to, we're going to design and define your environment um, with some sort of health goal or something that's giving you negative self-talk or self-judgment or shame um, right now. So the first step is we need to, and I'll use my own, I'll use something in my own life as an example for you guys. I don't care um, to make it easier to kind of see how, you know, you can do it. So step one is identify the few environments in your life that impact most of your motivation, happiness, and positive behavior. So how can you easily do or have more of that? Is it a place, an act, a person, a group? Um, so I thought about some of mine before this webinar and just wrote a few down. So it was, you know, in order for me to actually have an environment in which I do things like, you know, exercise and move enough and meditate and these other lifestyle choices that are important to me. I have to feel rested. I have to get a good night's sleep. I have to uh, get up early, usually. Um, I have to kind of get out first thing in the morning. So go on some sort of quick morning walk. Um, music is usually involved. Um, movement with music, even better. Um, and then cooking and eating from this organic farm that I go to in love where I am right now, you know, brings a lot of happiness and good, positive, you know, motivation to continue to eat well and cook for myself. So that's step one. So take 30 seconds, just write a few things down, a few environments that you know you can tie to having motiv more motivation when you do them or you see them or you listen to them or maybe it's a person, whatever as well as more happiness and positive behavior. And then we'll move on to step two. All right, so hopefully you've gotten a few written down and uh, you can always come back to this exercise after we hop off and write a few more. Um, step two is identify the negative environments around you. That's the opposite. So that create unhappiness, negative influence or demotivation. So what can you, once you have this list, I then want you to think, what can you cut out right now or what can you engage in or see or do less? Um, so go ahead and take a few minutes to, or just a minute or so to think about the negative environments. And sometimes it's stuff that just hasn't occurred to you. It could be a person in your life. It could be um, 
you know, like I, I know when I spend a lot of time in the morning in bed, that's very demotivating. It doesn't make me then want to do a lot. When I get up early and right away start with things, the whole day I do, I'm much more productive. So that one's positive for me. I know that drinking too much wine has a negative influence. Um, not, I've identified that it's not drinking, you know, wine at all. It's the drinking of too much that affects my sleep and, you know, makes me have regret and things like that and demotivates me the next day. So I know those are, are two important things. Um, but just, you know, some examples like that. So I'll give you a minute. I won't talk um, to think about those. All right, so hopefully you're ready to move on to step three. Again, you can come back to this exercise if you feel like you have a few more to write down. Um, step three is identify small environmental changes that will help to implement a habit without having to think about it too much. So an example of this is a study from Brian Wansick at Cornell University that found that people that eat, that eat 20, or sorry, found that people eat 22% less food by switching from 12 to 10 inch plates. Um, so this is just a fascinating little example of these small things that you can do that just help you make changes without you actually having to think about it. Because when our brain has to think about everything, it gets very overwhelmed. So the things that can be sort of automatic, hence why we do things that we've already been doing, it's a shortcut, um, are great. And then you don't have to, to worry about it. So um, you know, if it's eating, an eating related thing, um, you know, it could be if you're eating, let's say too many snacks or sweets or junk food, maybe it's not even buying those, not having them in the house makes it easier. Something you don't even have to think about. It's just not there. Or, uh, if you've been, I've been, I know I've been baking a lot of like gluten-free, you know, paleo style, uh, you know, baked goods, um, which, you know, are, are definitely on the healthier side of things, but they're still baked goods. And so, you know, I found myself thinking, you're eating too many of these. You need to just stop baking. That would help. Um, that's something you don't even have to think about. Then you don't have to worry and punish yourself because you were tempted to eat this delicious thing that's right in front of you. Um, so that's a good example. Or, um, you know, switching the plates, fabulous example. Or um, maybe you... Uh, have, you know, people that have uh, an appointment with a friend or a trainer or something like that first thing in the morning, or it makes it easier to not have to think, oh, do I want to work out? Do I not? It's just, you have to go. There's somebody waiting for you, that kind of thing. So these are all some small changes. So think about what you, you know, were kind of working on to do. And then what are these small little changes? Maybe it's like putting your alarm clock in a certain place or, you know, just these really simple things. I had one for drinking more water and I wasn't drinking nearly enough water during the quarantine, I noticed. So I started filling up a big pitcher, like a nice pitcher that you might put on a table during a dinner party for just myself and making sure that I drank it down every day so I could see how much I was really drinking. Um, that helped me drink so much more water right away and I didn't have to think how many glasses have I had, whatever. I just knew if I didn't finish the pitcher, you know, I didn't drink enough. Um, so these are some examples. So take you know, another 30 seconds to a minute to think of some small things. Um, and this is kind of, can be a little bit fun, actually, to think about these small things that might help that you're not doing right now. And then we'll move on to step four.
All right. So now the last part of this exercise, step four, is just revisiting some of the environments or habits and thinking about the ones that serve you in some way versus the ones that don't serve you at all. So you kind of want to, once you have this list, the things that don't serve you at all are the the easiest fat to cut right away. You know, that's um, the stuff that you can say, I'm just either not buying that, not doing that, not allowing that, whatever. Um, so I used the example before, I thought about this before the, the, you know, before this presentation. And I thought, you know, is, is drinking the problem? Like if I, should I quit drinking completely? And I thought, no, because it does serve me with some friends and it's, you know, delicious. And with my husband to unwind while we're playing cards or making a fire or whatever. Um, but it's when I drink more than a glass that I find it sends me into, you know, poor sleep and then a spiral. And then you, oh, you, you shouldn't have done that. And all the, all of that negative self-talk. So for me, the it's not serving me at all to stay in bed in the morning. I know that. There's absolutely nothing good that comes out of that. I never get out of bed after I've been kind of lying in bed for a while or snoozing for a while or, you know, on my phone for a while thinking like, oh, well, that did, you know, that felt good in this way. It always feels bad. So um, that's not to say sometimes I need more sleep. That's different. But just kind of being awake in bed in the morning doesn't serve me at all. So I know that's on my like cut to fat find a way to rewire my brain to be able to get out of bed quickly or need to get out of bed quickly in the morning. So think about a few of those and see if you can come up with this list of things that you can, you know, cut right away or that you can identify at least right away. Like this isn't serving me in any way. These are the things that I should really work on getting rid of right, right away. So just take, you know, 30 seconds. I won't speak to, to think about that. All right, so now we're moving on to the second part of this, which is habit replacement. So I think hopefully you remember I said there's no such thing as getting rid of a habit, right? So I can't just get rid of staying in bed in the morning too long, but I can replace it with a different habit, which is a, I wake up and I go do blank, right? So I have to replace it with something. So the next part of this exercise is step one, define a habit you'd like to change or replace as specifically as you can. The more you can define it, the better. So like eating healthy wouldn't be a good example, right? That's way too vague. And maybe it's um, cutting out processed foods or um, eating less, you know, smaller portions, or maybe it's um, cutting out sweets, something like that. Um, and then think about what it would look like and how would you feel when you got there? So really try to visualize and feel any emotions that come up when you have now replaced this habit. So, um, you know, what are you, if you're not eating sweets at four o'clock, what are you eating? You know, you have to replace it with something else or drinking or doing so that you don't go in the kitchen or something like that. Um, so take a second and do that. And then we will do step two. And remember to really try to visualize and feel the emotions. I will be quiet so that you can do that. All right. Now, 
step two. And if you have to come back to that one, definitely do so after this. Um, you might, you know, not have really had enough time to feel all the emotions that come with that or to visualize it thoroughly. Um, but you can do this over and over. So step two of this exercise is understand the conditions needed to make it happen and those that prevent it. So using the example of not snoozing and being on my phone in the morning in bed slash getting out of bed early, conditions that make it happen for me are going to bed early, getting good sleep, my husband getting me out of bed before he leaves the bedroom. That is like a cr critical moment. If he leaves the bedroom, chances are I will be in bed for a while. If he gets me out of bed right away or, you know, we get out of bed together, then chances are, you know, that's going to work out well. Um, conditions that make it not happy for me, not happen for me, excuse me, as I mentioned was drinking too much wine, eating too late so you have poor sleep or too much for dinner so you haven't digested, having caffeine. Um, I don't, I only drink decaf, but if you do drink caffeine, having it, you know, too late in the day or having too much, again, that would impact your sleep. Um, and of course, going to bed too late. So just not getting enough sleep and therefore being tired when my alarm goes off. So those are the conditions that I'd identified. So using what you use in step one, think about the conditions and write them down that need to happen and that also prevent it from happening. All right, and this is the last part of this habit replacement exercise, and then we will move on to some questions. Um, step three is understand what you're really willing to do. This is so important. So if you want to do a behavior, right, but you actually really don't want to do that or don't want to give that up, you know, if you say, I know I should quit smoking, but you love smoking, <laughs> then you're not really willing to do that. Um, so I would say if you can think about what you're really willing to do, you know, I, I use the example of I love the ritual and taste of coffee, but I was told because of some adrenal issues and just my body doesn't metabolize it well um, that I should give up caffeine. And I was, you know, I tried it first and I kept failing. I kept wanting that coffee so badly. And I realized it's because I just loved the whole thing. I loved getting up in the morning and going to get it and the taste of it and the ritual. And so I really wasn't willing to totally give it up. And so when I finally had that conversation with myself, but I switched to decaf, it was easy. I've never needed or craved a caffeinated coffee again. I just get decaf. Um, so that's an example of maybe you can figure out what you're not willing to do and have sort of an alternate goal or go a little bit deeper into why you're not willing to do it and think about what's behind that. Like what, what is really causing the not willing to do that? Are you afraid you're going to, you know, lose something about your relationship with somebody or um, do you just enjoy it? And, you know, why do you, if it's unhealthy, what is it about that that you enjoy that maybe you could replace with something else? Like I mentioned the sugar snack at four o'clock. Is there something else that you really like to eat or drink that's at four o'clock that maybe doesn't necessarily have sugar um, that you can replace that with? Or is it just that you love the sugar? So sometimes there's something else in there that you can um, figure out and use. So think about this for a second. I'll, I'll give you about 30 seconds. And then we'll move on to the last part. All right, so we're getting close to the end of this. So I uh, probably didn't give you enough time, but again, go through this exercise on your own again, if you're really trying to you know, change a habit and without the negative self-talk. Um, so step four of the habit replacement is bring attention to the replacement habit. So neuroplasticity requires that our brains bring attention to the new neural pathway for it to actually form. So try a few methods that really bring attention 
to the new habit in your brain. So an example is a phone reminder, telling your spouse that you're trying to do this thing, um, getting your best friend to do it with you, a, a sticky on your laptop so it's there, like you can't miss it every day that you, you know, open your laptop, something like that. Um, you could even wear a, you know, like a pink hair elastic or something to just remind you that you never take off about this thing that you, you know, trying to do. And if one doesn't work, if an alarm doesn't work or some sort of notification or some sign, you know, whatever it is, telling your spouse didn't work, keep trying, try another one um, until you find one that does work because you will and it's important to keep trying. Don't give up. All right, so final thoughts on this topic. Own your choices, even the crappy ones. Don't rationalize them, just own them. But I, what I mean by don't rationalize them is if you, let's say, we'll use the exercise example. If you skipped a workout, um, what's not helpful to making these important lifestyle changes for your short-term and long-term health, like exercise, is saying, oh, it's fine. Like, I went for a walk yesterday. Um, you know, like, I'll just you know, eat less or whatever, you know, some sort of rationalization in your head about why you didn't need to do it anyway. That's not helpful. <laughs> it's more helpful to just say, I didn't exercise today. It is what it is. I'll try again tomorrow. Um, so which leads me to my second one, which is have no regrets. Imagine that you have horse blinders on that make it so that you can only look forward and not backwards. Um, because it is completely unhelpful to think about what you didn't do yesterday or even this morning and only helpful to think about what you might be able to do later today or tomorrow. And then on the same vein, always try again and always show up again. Stopping and starting, let's say, a meditation practice over and over has more benefits than no meditation practice at all. So if you're beating yourself up and ready to give up because you can't keep a meditation practice consistent, it's okay. It's better that let's say over three months you meditated 50 days than, you know, no days. It doesn't matter if, you know, you're not doing it at all. It has, or rather you're not doing it every single day or that you haven't been completely consistent because it does have benefits as do exercise and eating well and, you know, sleep and all that stuff. It's not a do it perfectly or don't do it at all. Um, and as Michael Jordan says, I was watching his uh, documentary on ESPN, uh, every day just do better and be better. There is no such thing as ar arriving at perfect and then staying there forever. So top athletes, you know, the healthiest people on the planet, they don't, you know, get there and then never have a day that they fall off or, you know, decide to do something unhealthy or whatever that is. It happens to literally every human. You have to keep showing up, trying again, being better than you were yesterday, and just doing better than you did the day before, no matter where you are in your health, where you are in your career, in your life, in your relationship. That's really the only thing that matters is that you know that everybody can do better and everybody can be better. And so let's just try again tomorrow and, you know, use the things that we talked about in this presentation so that you're not just trying to, you know, force it, right? If you don't, if you're not willing to make certain changes or you haven't changed the environment, um, then it's really unlikely that that change will happen, which will be really frustrating and where that negative self-talk and self-judgment comes from. But once you've de defined and designed an environment to make it happen um, and, you know, left all the regret and negativity behind if you don't do it, then you can just keep trying, keep trying. And over time, that keep trying could actually rewire your brain and become the status quo and the new normal, which is the goal. So uh, we're, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Again, I am not a therapist. I'm not a life coach. Um, I am an avid health researcher and um, patient advocate. So my whole mission is dedicated to health empowerment um, and all of the things that we've created at Wellbe, you know, the Spark Health online program, all of our free content interviews, investigative guides, and actually um, a few new services and resources that we're building right now, all dedicated to this health empowerment. Um, 
this is re the, really the root of why I wanted to do this presentation is that um, I think that you can't be empowered in your health if you're constantly beating yourself up about what you are, are not doing. So it starts with what you've got going on in your own mind, and then you can utilize a lot of the information and inspiration and resources that we have to actually take you through your health journey. So as I is written on the screen, health empowerment is a process. You have to understand where you are in that journey. So whether you are somebody who has, you know, no real health issues, but you're just trying to improve your health and make sure you don't get any, or you're somebody who has had some health issues and you're really in the process of figuring out what those are and trying to reverse them naturally, or you're somebody who's put in a lot of work because you did have health issues and now you've sort of come out on the other side. But, you know, as I said, you don't arrive there and stay perfect forever. It's still work to make sure it's, you know, stays away, whatever the issue or illness was, and you need to continue to improve and develop yourself and your wellness to make sure that, you know, you can remain healthy. So all of those are different stages, but Wellbe is a resource, I hope, for all of those different stages. Um, so, you know, we're really focused on integrative health and wellness, if you didn't already know that. Um, just, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have uh, followed us and know that for a long time. Um, but, you know, really, it's these two pieces that are so important within that is the you know, making sure that you treat these 100 choices you make a day as your healthcare and use everything you can to make sure that you can avoid healthcare. And then when you do need it, understanding that the conventional system is quite broken and using us to figure out and access um, great integrative and functional medicine practitioners and therapies and really understand what your options are and what the research supports um, before just, you know, kind of giving up your power to a doctor who maybe isn't thinking about, you know, really resolving or healing your um, health issues, but more so just managing symptoms or kind of dismissing you or whatever it might be. Um, so that's really what we're focused on. That's why I wanted to put together this presentation. I learned so much myself from all of this research that I gathered. And it's really encouraging to know that, you know, we can get rid of or severely reduce this negative self-talk, this judgment, um, and that, you know, this is something we're hardwired to do. And as long as we see that, we can actually sort of biohack our way out of it. And then on top of that, that we can make these lifestyle changes and healthy habits stick that really we really want to have in our lives um, without that judgment. So it's really a two-part process. Um, so that's me. I, as I said, I'm happy to answer any questions. You can unmute yourself um, and ask them. Oh, let me see. Okay, Sharon. Thank you. Um, oh, she said empowering people to help themselves is what it is all about the ripple effect of that in their families and communities is immeasurable. Immeasurable. I totally agree, Sharon. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and Eden said, if anyone's looking for more resources on building habits, I just finished the book Atomic Habits by James Clear and highly recommend. That's great. Thank you for that suggestion, Eden. Um, but any other questions that you have about, um, you know, negative self-talk and self-judgment or also habit change and, you know, making things stick or about Welby or anything else where I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes to, to answer them. As I mentioned, um, we are in the process of building a few new exciting resources and services right now, in addition to our signature Welby Spark Health program, which will be back in January, 2021. Um, it's a lot of work for our team, so I don't think we'll be running it before that, um, but we had a great experience with the class that you know finished in March. Um, and so in the meantime, the best place I think to stay empowered in your health and to um, you know, get all the resources and information uh, that, you, that you need to do that with um, are through our interviews and investigative guides and you know, inspirational stories and all of that. Um, that come out weekly in our newsletter and are on obviously getwellbe.com and are on the Wellbe podcast. And then we share little tidbits, but you know, less on Instagram, Facebook, um, and then all of the interviews are, are on YouTube. So um, at Get Wellbe is the social channels and you can, um, you know, we, we, we don't hound people 
with emails. Uh, we're just, you know, a weekly newsletter. We usually put out one to two pieces of content a week. So it's not overwhelming. I really know about inbox fatigue. So I try to respect people's inboxes. Um, and yeah, hopefully you can stay tuned for, for what we have next. And I really want to hear if you, you know, go back to these exercises about, you know, defining and anxiety designing your environment or habit change. Um, and let me know if you actually go through it with a real, you know, habit that you're trying to change and what comes of that, as well as if you can use some of the, the four things that we identified to reduce some of that negative self-talk and self-judgment um, and see if it, if, if that helps as well. So I'm really curious. You can reach out to hello at get well, the hello at get well the anytime um, to let us know and we will or message us on Instagram either one and uh, I'll be super excited to share that if it's positive or just talk to you about it if it's not so all right everyone well it is just about six o'clock I'm sure you all have you know walks to take and dinner to get started and um, I know it's a obviously a very strange time um, so just take care of yourself, realize your mental health is important um, and do your best to stay positive in your mind um, and to stay healthy in your physical health as well because um, the staying home all the time, it uh, makes people move less, makes people eat more you know, junk or eat more in general. So there are some health implications that are important to look out for, but I know that with everything we talked about today, you'll be fully armed to make fantastic choices and um, have the best experience in this otherwise very stressful and traumatic um, pandemic. So I hope you have a great night and thank you for joining.